Corey, I want to verify. Am I uh, am I coming across? Can you hear me? Oh yes. You're very very clear. Fantastic. Okay. Also, uh, I tried sharing my desktop using Zoom, uh, and Zoom doesn't seem to like uh, the latest versions of Fedora for sharing. So, uh, if someone can share the agenda, that'd be fantastic. Sure, I'll do that. Great, thanks. Many thanks. Can you see my screen? I can. Uh, yes. Okay, we'll give it a few more moments and then we'll start it off. Okay, well, let's go ahead and uh, get started. So as always, uh, let's start with some agenda bashing. So is there anything that anyone would like to discuss in this meeting that is not on the agenda? Uh, please speak up and we'll get it onto the agenda. Well, I guess I'll throw something out there. So I see, I see John on the call. There was one item that came out of my review of, of John's uh, PR 247. So I'll, I'll add that to the agenda. It was, John, this was the item of like, you know, it kind of in tree versus out of tree plugins. Um, and, and if they're in tree, the directory structure you proposed, I, I thought we should discuss that as a broader team. Yeah, I mean, yeah, get get up to the feedback be good. And what I proposed was just a a, a a hack. It was not a you know well thought out. So more just that we want to be doing. No, no, no. It's it's definitely definitely good to bring it up, and yeah. and I, I think it's something we can evolve to. I don't anticipate maybe implementing something in the full way one way or another, but, but definitely something we should start to discuss, I think is as a broader team. Uh, things kind of went quiet from my perspective. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, I ended somehow ended up on mute. Um, okay, so just a just a reminder: add yourself to the attendees list if you haven't done so already. And um, up, upcoming events: so we have Cloud Native uh, Network Function Seminar at the Open Source Summit on Tuesday, August twenty eighth. So that is the Tuesday. So uh, make sure that if you are attending and you haven't registered already, that when you do register, you click the checkbox to help you get in. Um, see, I don't have any special announcements. Does anyone have any special announcements they want to talk about? Uh, 
Okay. Uh, so we are starting to use DependBot to automatically push pull uh, pull requests to update our Go dependencies. Um, and so, uh, does someone want to talk about that? Yeah, that was that was me. So I'm I'm definitely happy to to discuss. So so this so so one thing that I've noticed over the last couple of months is a, a lot of times. Well, I mean, basically our our de our dependencies end up being out of date fairly frequently. And I notice this when you know I want to go and specifically update a dependency, and I'll do dep ensure, and it will pull in lots of other updates uh, on top of that, right? So so I did a little bit of looking into this, and I found this um, this dependabot, uh, which will which is essentially it does exactly that. It will just simply go through and push PRs, and um, for basically this is. The, the people that wrote this code, the code is the code for the bot is all open source. They actually, you know, have a company around it called Dependabot. But for open source projects, um, it's free to use it. You can hook it up. Um, so I, I liked it be, because the code was actually available. If we ever wanted to do this ourselves, we could. Um, but it actually, if you look at the two updates that I merged that it pushed, they're actually incredibly detailed updates that include all the changes. From the new dependency, um, in, in, in you know, including a bunch of links and everything like that as well. So it seemed like something that was super useful. Um, I also like that it just pushes the PRs, and we um, get a chance to review them and decide if we if we want them or not. So thoughts from anyone else? Seems good. Yeah, I like the idea, um, especially when you consider, you know, if. So I assume it's using our our DEP, and it's not like it's not updating outside of uh, outside of that, right? Correct. It's using our 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 DEP exactly, and and our and it'll yeah exactly. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, and one good trend that we're seeing in the Go community is that there is a push towards getting semantic versioning, and so the more the community adopts semantic versioning, the more useful this tool becomes. I agree completely. Yeah, so I can so definitely. In fact, um, let me let me one second here, and I will I will show I will post a link to 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 some of these. Um, actually, hold on. The one way I can do this that's a little bit easier is this. Just a sec. So here's an example, um, and I'll put it in the chat so people can take a peek. There's an example of of what the bot proposes um, and what they look like uh, from a pull, pull request perspective. So it's actually, the pull request is super, uh, thank you, Lucina, for, for sharing that. Yeah, if you click on one of those, you can see um, that the, the pull requests are quite detailed and include, you know, release notes, individual commits, um, super, super useful. I, I was pretty pleased with this, actually. Uh, I'm curious. I mean, uh, you know that with the 111, Go 111, there's a new model of the dependencies coming in, and so I, th I mean, with this, this will kind of become um, well outdated or not used anymore. So, uh, are we are we kind of sticking with the 110 uh, Golang, or uh, will move to 111 at one point? So. Correct me if I'm wrong, but we don't. One eleven doesn't become incompatible with with DEPs. It just provides a mechanism, correct? Yeah, exactly. It has a this feature this is disabled by default, but you can enable it. Okay. I mean, that also, be... how, how? Sorry, go on. No, please go ahead. Yeah. So one question that comes to mind, I I, I took a quick view of the go. Uh, of the dependency stuff, and uh, perhaps I got this wrong, but uh, does does it only did, does it perform this action for all dependencies, or does it only perform the the modularization specifically for uh, for the Go project itself with updating uh, like uh, the the Go packages that aren't part of the core. SDK, but are still provided by by the Go team as like extensions. Are you are you asking if Dependabot performs those updates for that, or I, I just not, want to not, be clear. not Dependabot the the new one eleven. Oh. 
uh, Vigo model. Ah, cool. Okay, that that uh, Sergey probably knows that then, or maybe not. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, I haven't tested it, but uh, my understanding is that uh, it takes a dependency file, doesn't matter which packages you have, and it converts into the modular. So, uh, like, it's not just the Go, uh, Go components. All the packages will be treated in a different way. Uh, I mean, yeah, like the modular way. But I haven't tested it, so... And, um, I'm I'm still waiting for official 111 release. I don't want to play with beta. Yeah, I definitely agree. And, uh, that's a good question. We could ask the uh, the uh, the people who built this bot as well to see how how it interacts with that new system and see if they have any plans for integration. So, so I have a, I have another question. Then does does this new this new um, this new thing that that we're talking about how, how does that interact with with the DEP dependencies? Is, uh, or does it make use of DEP, or is it, is it some new thing? It becomes obsolete. So the, the DEP, it goes away with the new approach completely. I mean, they have a transition, so you can convert. Uh, when when that new VGO modular way uh, gets activated, it can detect that you have a dependency file. It converts it into the modular uh, list, and then you from, from that point on, you use it uh, for few, in future. So, ah, okay, interesting. It strikes me that, that we may want to play with this a little bit more before we actually make a call. I think it's definitely a good thing to play with. And then we also need to think a little bit about how bleeding edge we want to be in terms of the requirement on the Go compilers. Uh, not everyone leaps forward to the newest version the first week it comes out. So I, I, I think this is fascinating and, and really interesting and we should definitely look at it, but I don't think we're probably going to make a call today and probably not immediately upon when 111 comes out. We'll have to sort of get used to it a bit first. Does that make sense? Yeah, I definitely agree with that. And also the 111, my understanding was that it's not, in, this is not enabled by default. So uh, we have time to try it out even. We, we could still move to 111 without bringing in this new paradigm. So is this, the, uh, I have a dumb question here and I, maybe the answer is right in front of me looking at uh, number 246 here, um, pull request 246, but is it clear how to use that for those of us that are submitting or planning to submit a, a PR? Or does it so, like, transparent? So it us? should be, it, it should be, so if you submit a PR that adds new dependencies, um, that your PR will include those, and then what the dependent bot will do is it will it will detect those new ones on the next time it runs, and so it will then check for updates uh, going forward to those dependencies. So so you won't have to deal with the updates. Um, so does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. And of course, so once that and that of course will happen only once the PR is uh, merged. Correct. Yep. Correct. It should make it pretty seamless once once um, once you merge code that adds a new dependency. Then from that point forward, the the dependent bot um, right. will will take over, making sure that that stays up to date and and we get security fixes for that uh, dependency and, and and so forth. Good. No weird side effects. That's good. Yep. Yeah. The the only weird side effects are those we choose to merge ourselves. So. <laughs> um. Well. well We'll go ahead and we'll, um, we have a pretty big uh, topic that we that we want to jump on top of. So uh, we'll go ahead and uh, give Dependabot a, a shot and see how it works. And with that, I want to push it towards the draft of the email uh, proposing for the uh, Network Service Mesh work group. So Ed, you have the floor. Yeah, um, cool. So, Oh, excellent. Thank you so much, Lucina. Much appreciated. So um, basically, there's been, um, we're, we're sort of ramping up. The suggestion we got from Sig Networking was to seek to become a Kubernetes working group. Um, and apparently, there is an email that you send to sort of kick that process off. And so I, I've been trying to work together with various folks to draft that email. And I wanted to sort of 
float it up to the broader community um, so that folks could comment and we could take a look at it. We can take a quick look at it here, um, but you know, it's also commentable uh, if you, from the link. So you can definitely please go and add comments. We would like to send it out sometime early next week. So if folks could comment today or over the weekend, that would be super, super helpful. Um, do you want to just go ahead and scroll down? We'll walk through a little bit the email. And by the way, much of the prose here was stolen from Frederick's excellent What is NSM um, you know, document that he wrote. So you, know, you get the executive summary, the network service meshes a novel approach to solving complicated L2 and L3 use cases in Kubernetes. They're tricky to address with the existing networking model inspired by Istio. You know, we map those concepts to L2 and L3 payloads. Um, and this is a request for a Kubernetes working group around network service mesh. Then we sort of talk about the problem, right? We go through and talk about the issues with, you know, telcos, SPs, 5G, uh, et cetera. Um, then we sort of point out that, you know, these are people who have advanced L2, L3 use cases. And the, what we have right now doesn't really work for them. That's the second paragraph under problem statement. Um, and then, you know, we talk a little bit about some of the, the you know, current generation uh, assumptions about things that are going on and that you know, these assumptions and Kubernetes networking implementation work beautifully for existing app developers um, you know, and should not be changed um, in a way that makes them less useful for app developers. And, but, Ed, mm -hmm. quick, quick comment about the, the telco emphasis, emphasis there. Mm -hmm. I would also include some enterprise use cases as well because a lot of could you could you drop a comment pointing out those sure, sure. that would be really super helpful to me i'm aware of those use cases in the generic sense but i think you're a lot closer to those use cases than i am okay um but i, I think that actually helps a great deal making it less telco focused um because especially since for kubernetes you know, there is a much bigger market in enterprise than there is in telco. So I think that's really, really good. The other thing to, I'm not sure that this is something <clears throat> we want to stress is people like Google and Amazon and Azure are basically going to lock down their CNI infrastructure. It's like their CNIs when you use their infrastructure, so you can't really extend networking. Mm -hmm. So with NSM, you can extend networking. I'm not quite sure how to say that, or if even want to, even if you want to, go into that rat hole. Uh, if you could add a comment, sort of like with a little bit of hum a few bars and a comment as to what you might suggest we put there and where. I, I I'm, actually I'm, I'm, just not, I'm not even sure we all want to put it there. But I'm just it's, it's a bit of a you know. Oh, right, Ed. I mean, uh, this is an email to request a working group, right? So, I mean, if it's too long, I'm afraid that like not too many people will read it anyway. Like first couple of lines, maybe that's it. Um, yeah, I get that, that's, that's absolutely true. And Kyle had made that point earlier. Um, I'm very open to finding ways to shorten it. Uh, and that is partially why I put the executive summary at the front um, and why we have references at the end. Um, so, so one, one thought I had was, and I know I mentioned this, Ed, uh, when I reviewed this uh, last week, but I, I'll just mention it in the meeting was, um, you know, one thing we could do is we could link to, to um, what, what Frederick wrote for the detailed portion of this and then just have kind of a summary at the top. And maybe that maps to what Sergey is suggesting as well. Yeah, I mean, so what, what it may actually, let me, let me sort of throw this out there, which is, um, okay, so we, let, let's go back up to the top of the executive summary. So we have this executive summary. If we were to have, keep the executive summary and the, um, if we were to keep the executive summary and the use cases, or not the use cases, the executive summary, and then um, have the references at the end, what would we want to add to the executive summary briefly to make it relatively complete? Because there, the, 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 there's, there are two dynamics at play here, right? The, the first dynamic with which both Kyle and Sergey are right about is that people don't read long emails. The second dynamic, which is also true, is that they often don't follow links from emails. Um, and so we want to get the shortest possible thing in the executive summary that's sufficient, and then probably just drop to the references. 
Does that make sense? Yep. Um, and then I, I think probably one of the things we do want to be clear about in the executive summary is that we're not seeking to change the existing networking that works so well for um, app developers. Um, I think that's going to be an important point. I think one thing we need to be very clear about as well is what is our, our goal with the working group? Because um, our if, if we come across as our goal is to market network service mesh, we're absolutely going to be rejected, and rightfully so. Uh, if our goal is about how can we find the issues in Kubernetes that we may run into in the various environments and uh, add another actionable items into it, then we're much more likely to to have this accepted. Yeah, I, I think that's actually tr a good point. And I think one of the other things that we need to sort out is wh where network service mesh is going to get really fascinating for a lot of folks is um, as we mature and we settle out what the API is, for example, particularly the NSM to NSM communication, because you know my guess is that most people will probably just deploy the network service manager um, that we provide to their, their Kubernetes cluster, although they're free to write their own. But um, when you talk about external network service managers and proxy network service managers, there are gonna be lots of other people who are going to want to write those. And so I think being able to document uh, the architecture and the API is involved as it matures uh, also is something that we wanna to wanna to call out as a goal for the working group. Yeah, Ed, uh, Al Morton, I, I was, I'm struck with the idea that what we want to replicate is uh, exactly the description that they have for current working groups, except for network service mesh. And, and that way it, it becomes uh, sort of a very consumable thing that, uh, you know, they've already read for existing working groups. And I think that covers the scope comments and, and, and so forth. What we, what, what's in scope, what's out of scope. I, that's, that sounds like a good way to approach it. Okay, so we can definitely take a look at that. There's a link at the top to the recent IoT Edge email. Um, this is the one that was just successful with the IoT Edge working group. Um, and they were relatively, you know, they were relatively unstructured, which is part of why, you know, they, they, they basically, you know, talked through, okay, you know, we've got these things going on, you know, some of the things we've identified are this, some of the people who are interested are that. Um, and then they didn't really talk a whole lot about what they were going to do or the in scope or out of scope. Um, I think those are both excellent suggestions. And if you, it sounds like you've seen more structured proposals that might be good to crib off of, is that so? Uh, yeah, but not in CNCF. Um, I, I mean, I, I, I started to, Started to search for that and then realized I better get back to the screen. I'm supposed to be looking at <laughs> But that's I mean, I think that would ultimately that's uh, What people sort of want in projects, uh, you know uh, goals uh, colossal non goals and, and you know where what we're gonna mess with and what we're not and I, I am so stealing the phrase colossal non goals <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's, that's one I love. I, I, I seldom write a document anymore without, without putting one sentence about that. The, the, um, I, I, I guess that the, um, you know, the real advantage is, uh, to, uh, you know, to, to be clear. And, and also, I think the background information should basically say, you know, we've been meeting for two months and, it, and it's this, this, these 25 people and, and uh, you know, and here's our repo and, and stuff like that to, to really show that this is real. Yeah, I mean, one of the other things I actually do want to ask is, one of the things they noticed is they sort of called out um, some, some various companies that are interested in the working group forming. And, you know, and, and I, I'm curious if folks have opinions on being included in such a list for network service mesh. Um, I, I, we've got really broad participation going on in the community here, but I, I, I'm sensitive about, you know, not calling those things out without people being okay. I, I think you can list the affiliations that people put, you know, and, and they sign in each week, but to, but to somehow imply that there might be official policy for some of the companies that we're affiliated with, maybe, 
Make would it be, would more it be problems. fair to say that there's been community participation from... Um, yes. Really, uh, yes, that. exactly, exactly. That, that stops quite a bit short of endorsement, um, but it is factually accurate. Yeah, and it, um, it works better when you're working with the public company models because public companies don't like for us to say, we're endorsing this. Oh God! Yes. No, I, 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 you know, I, I've, I've worked with Cisco's PR and AR apparatus, and, and worse than that, I've had to work on cross-company PR and AR uh, things in other communities. And oh no, that's hard. <laughs> that's really hard. Um, yeah, I so. agree with Fred. To list the number of affiliations just indicates the broad base we're building in the community. Okay. It doesn't really imply how, because it's new yet, and uh, some of those companies may not be quite ready to to ha build a strategy around, uh, you know, around uh, this this future or and current uh, project. Yep. Yeah, please keep it um, very soft or else I'll get into a lot of trouble. <laughs> so so, so just, just to be really clear, and I, I, the reason I wanted to bring this up is I absolutely don't want to get anyone in any trouble, right? Um, you know, is the way I would phrase it is there, you know, there have been, there's been participation in the network service mesh community from, um, you know, from, you know, dot, 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 various companies. Um, and, and so just simply keep it at participation. Could you say individuals from various companies? I absolutely can say individuals from various companies. I think yeah, that might be a... Softer. Yep. No, I'm, I'm, I'm totally down for that. My, my main point is we, we have sort of two competing interests, one of which is overwhelming. Uh, the overwhelming interest is not getting anybody in trouble. Um, and, and then the, the, act, the, the second interest, which is also large but not overwhelming, is we want to show that we have a broad base of support. So it, it sounds like I need to go take another turn of the crank on this email uh, to shorten it and make it more focused on goals colossal long goals, uh, participation from individuals from, that kind of stuff. Um, does anyone else want to help with the drafting process? I am more than delighted to add edit rights to people who want to help with the drafting process. Um, yes. Okay, cool. So I think you already I'm, added me as well. You again. I'm sorry, what? Hmm? I said that I'm definitely happy to review uh, uh, and provide some, some feedback again too. Yeah, yeah. So the good news is the link to this is publicly commentable, meaning anyone with a link can add a comment. Um, so the the, the ask was you know, who else would like to help drafting because such people need to have edit rights. So it sounds like I need to add Tom uh, to that list, and I'm delighted to do that. Anybody else? Yeah, I'm adding your names to the um, to the agenda as well. Cool. So speak, speak up. I have Tom and I have me. Uh, who else wants added access? I'm going to stick Kyle down. Uh, yeah, go ahead and add me as well, please. Okay, cool, cool. And, and I'm adding, and I'm adding Sergey. Uh, anyone else wants to, want to be added onto it? I, I'm, I'm happy with just comment rights for the moment. This is Al. Yep, it's all good. Um, okay. So let me go ahead and make sure I get all the, the various people added with edit rights. Um, yep. Cool. And add, add yourself to the list if, uh, if you can't speak up, and uh, we'll make sure we get to you. OK, is there anything else that we want to talk on this particular subject, or have we, have we completed this? OK, so I think I've now added all of the appropriate people uh, with can you listed with can edit rights. So if you can't edit, uh, now then it's time to complain, but not necessarily here. But pick me. Okay, and as a reminder, the proposal date is on the 17th, which is one week from now. And uh, okay, so uh, is there anything else we want to discuss on the uh, on the proposal, or are we good to move on? 
I'm good to move on. Okay. Let's see. So we have the uh, cross factor uh, X factor CNF. Uh, the reason it's an X right now is because we don't know how many numbers there will be. So now we have a few people from who were not present last time that I wanted uh, to discuss about this particular idea from, especially from the from the Volk uh, uh, group. And so one of the, one of the things that I am hoping for that we can do to help the community understand what a CNF is, and uh, not just for network service mesh, but any any CNF is I, I think it'd be a good idea to to push towards a uh, sort of like the 12 factor apps that we have in uh, in Kubernetes where you follow a set of you follow a set of heuristics uh, you have some number of uh, cloud native function heuristics you can follow th that uh, that help you de develop and maintain and operate cloud native functions. And so one of the things that I've been doing is I've been going through the 12 factor app heuristics in, uh, in detail. So that way I can, I can under make sure that I, like I already have a good understanding of the 12 factor app. So it's like, it's review for me, but I want to, to make sure that I get those finer points. And they actually have a website uh, you can go to for those that are interested. Uh, so if you type in 12 factor app into your favorite search engine, the first hit should be 12 factor, 12 factor apps websites and they have a list and each list item, uh, there's a little bit of a discoverability issue, but if you click on the, on each main bullet point, it actually takes you to a full web page that describes like when they talk about um, when, when they talk about a particular topic, uh, then they go into full detail as to what, what they really, what they really mean by that. And so suppose that you had someone like, what do they mean by config, store config in the environment? And then what do they really mean by that? Yeah. So, uh, Lucina has the example up till factor.net. You know, or they say that they su to support concurrency and scale out by, con by concurrency. Like, what, what do they mean by that? Now, the reason I'm suggesting we don't go with just 12 factor app that's vanilla is that the context is significantly different. So the context is around building scalable web applications. And what we're looking at is how do we build scalable cloud native functions and ultimately reach uh, scalable, uh, cloud network services and uh, an edge and and IoT and and so on and it may even come to it might even be that we might have to create different in the long run create different flavors of these type of of heuristics but yeah what what I would like what I would love to see is um, some work towards towards pushing on this and you know if we, if we can come up if we can come in even with just some type of a, a draft for the ONS, or, sorry, the, not the ONS, the Open Source Summit uh, CNF get together that we're having on Tuesday. Like, I, I think that that would help push the push the community along. So, um, any uh, any thoughts, thoughts on, this? on this? So, I I, I I like the idea quite a lot. I, I'm actually very tempted just to keep the label X Factor because it's really cool. Um, but I well, suppose at some point you have to come up with a number. We we can keep it as X factor as well because we, if we if we're talking about edge versus IoT, the number is going to be different. You're going to have different concerns, and so if we keep it as X factor, if if that's what we decide to do, then we we, we do have an excuse for doing so. Like maybe these are the twelve <laughs> IoT and the in the fifteen edge and and so on, and so it, so it has to be an X factor. My, my only concern is that people don't mistake it for 10 factor. Very limited use of Latin numerals in the, in the current age. This is true. And I, I'm not even sure they teach it in, uh, in schools anymore. Uh, this is um, Watson. I like the idea as well. The 12 factor one thing is um, 12 factor came, like it was kind of harvested out of a lot of pain from deploying and doing things and it kind of took the best practices out with um, 
as far as CNFs being kind of new, it seems like we're having to draw from maybe um, NFEs and other projects like ONAP and some of these other projects um, for kind of a base for the best practices. So that's only my only concern. But if it, if we're doing it that way, like harvesting from those that pain, um, then I think there's a lot of lessons we can learn or, and apply. Yeah, that's an excellent point. And to be clear, the 12 factor app was, uh, was created primarily, or it was driven, I'll say, not, not created, but driven primarily by one of the co-founders of Heroku. And so they certainly had the context to build such a, uh, such documents and do a good job with it. And, you know, it's, it's clear that any one group or any one uh, at this particular point in this space likely doesn't have that context yet. So that, that's actually a really, a really good point. Um, um, but that, that I think actually is, is even stronger argument for uh, keeping the X factor because effectively where the 12 factor app really settled out of, okay, we've put this shit out from a lot of experience. Part of what we're talking about in the X factor uh, CNFs is trying to distill the, the experience as we discover it. Uh, it's more of an active process rather than a codification. Uh, I wonder, I'm thinking about this and I'm thinking about like when you try to codify best practices and stuff, which is what this is an effort to do. And um, in one of my other lives, uh, we tried to do some of that. And, and it gets to a certain point sometimes when it gets controversial. The, uh, the issue with network implementing pieces of the network is sometimes you have to break rules that other people think are good practices. And the same thing goes with what used to be called embedded in IoT. So we might be care a little bit careful about this early in the project. I don't know, you know, setting down some um, uh, too many guidelines. I'm I'm wondering if um, it, 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 we may be creating more. Some I I don't know. I I think let let's just move toward toward the advantages of CNF, but not really sound like we're dictating people how to code their CNFs yet. Um, anyway, we're just we're providing a platform to make it easier to build CNF. I'm not sure yet we care what is inside them. You know, sometimes they may be internal to telcos and things like that and not open source necessarily themselves to, I don't know, it's just some random thoughts that pop into my head. You don't have to write them all down, but. I think they're, I think they're excellent points. And one of the, one of the reasons that I was looking at this is, uh, so when I was, when I was looking at early adoption of Docker and early adoption of Kubernetes and so on. Uh, these type of uh, these type of techniques and and so on uh, were not very were not very apparent upfront. And so, like, where should you keep your configuration? You know, and I've we we saw deployments range from bake it into your image down to, you know to create a config server somewhere to inject uh, inject files in at these locations and, and so on and uh, you know the so there's we're definitely going to have a lot of different ways and a lot of experimentation and what I'm what I'm looking for more is rather than say so, so there's, there's a couple parts to it. one of them is not to really have like a code of things but more that's why I use the, the term heuristic is that it there's there are patterns that if you follow may make your life easier, but you absolutely should break them if it makes sense to do so. And the second part is uh, now, now that I'm thinking about this uh, in more detail of what such a organization would look like, it's, um, I, I, I do think that this would be a living document and we'd have to start off really early. Like these are the, you know, even just starting to identify, these are the type of benefits that we're, that we're looking for and, and identifying what other, what other organizations or what, or not organizations, what other communities do to solve some of these issues and start pulling them together. Like 
for so for example, when you start talking about scalability, um, even though CNFs may have different purposes and have different inputs and outputs from your standard 12 vector app, there's still only a limited way to scale things out. You either scale vertically or you scale horizontally or you make your process uh, that much more efficient so that you don't need to scale uh, as much uh, from the number of processes and threads that you have. And so some of these patterns I think will apply regardless of whether they're CNFs or 12-factor apps. Uh, but there's others that like that don't make any sense that from the 12-factor app side as well. Like 12-factor app uh, considers everything to be a, a resource and prefers port binding. And we are the port binding. And so it, it's, um, so some of them start to to fall apart in, in that particular area. And coming up with what the organizational structure of such a set of heuristics would look like and where do we draw the line, I think it's going to be, we have to be very careful with that, assuming that we decide to proceed in this direction at all. And just and be very sensitive to the diversity of the community because i also think this community is is going to be even though it's going to be a a smaller community it's going to be a much more diverse community than the type of applications that you generally see in uh, in the standard and uh, uh 12 factor app world you know and, and diversity in the sense of technologies the technologies that we use and the ways that we communicate does, does that make sense? So, yeah, so I, I think even if we, if we just start with, uh, you know what? What are what are the benefits we're aiming for? I think that's a fantastic, uh, fantastic example, and st and we can start linking some of those to you know these are some of the paths we that we've identified as possible ways to do that. Ask other people to contribute, and then in time, a year down the line, two years down the line, etc., we just continue to refine and saying these are the best practices that we found, and here are the problems that we found, and then we can eventually come up with something that says this is how we build. You know, you're you're a newcomer. This is how you, or you're a new employee at one of these companies. This is how you build. So, okay, let's, let's check the uh, check the agenda. Okay. Uh, so we don't. We have about 15 minutes left. So I'm going to go over some of the uh, some of the other parts relatively fast. So we have we have Ian who is looking at Ian Wells who is looking at the SRIOV on Packet.net. Uh, and un quite unfortunate, um, there have been issues with SRIOV. Uh, he actually posted something on the IRC channel, so I will copy and uh, paste that. Uh, but unfortunately, the standard builds uh, or configurations of the packet.net uh, do not, like they, they show that, I, that SRR IOV is there, uh, but he cannot actually create any VFs out of them. And so, there's the, uh, there's the link of his there's the link. So, so I need to move so that Taylor, over. Taylor, I, I, I have the sense that I recall that Michael had had a little bit of success getting SROV working in the last couple of days. Do you remember? Yeah, um, and I had some requests and to Packet as well about this. There was a thread um, on Packet. I don't know if I added to this ticket um, a link to that, but. They, they do have some servers with support. Um, it, well, it's really, I guess, what level of support. So the CNX 4, go ahead. I was just say, one of the things to watch out for, because it's confusing as all hell if you're used to handing Nix over to DPDK, 
is apparently there is a relatively new kind of DPDK driver that will share the NIC with the kernel, normal kernel interface driver. So one of the things yeah. that I know Michael and I confused for days was we would try and bind to the VF and we would see a kernel interface for both the VF and the PF. And we were sure that something was wrong. And I reached out to some friends at, at Mellanox and they're like, no, here is link to explanation of the fact that this is a real thing. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's tricky. Yeah. Um, we were able to get um, the virtual interfaces to show up. There seems to be a lot of other settings. So it's besides what type of packet server you're on, um, it may or may, something may or may not be enabled in Grub. So you may need to do that. And then a lot of items. Make sure you're not on an AMD machine. You get everything else right. And that may be the case and that doesn't work. So one, um, one option that we have as well, and we'd have to coordinate with the CNCF to, to do this is that uh, if, if they were to uh, allow us to set up a long-term box uh, that's that's running that we can we can set that box in BIOS to support it and it sounds like they're like packet.net is willing to set it for that particular purpose uh, but they're not willing to they're not either willing or able I can't tell the difference at this point to set uh, BIOS parameters when you spin up an on-demand system so, so uh, if the lowest cost option supports SRIOV, then one option that we have is to uh, provision a couple of those. I think they run at fifty dollars a month, um, so it's not not too bad. And uh, we essentially reserve those for the use of uh, of our uh, SRIOV testing. Yeah, I know one of the things also is apparently uh, Intel Nix. Work much more. I don't know if it's that Intel NICs work better for this purpose, or that more people are familiar with how to make them work. It's a little hard to tell, um, but I, I do know that there that that we have people who know how to achieve success with SRIOV with Intel NICs. and so if we were going to stand up, you know, dedicated boxes for some reason, um, I do know the right people to petition for donation of NICs if it comes to that. Nice, and that's something that uh, that the packet.net people have told me is that they do have the capability to stand up uh, hardware for us, and if we can get them NIC cards, they should be able to drop them in as well. So, of course, we'd want to verify this more formally before we were to perform some form of a transfer, but initial discussions uh, sounds like we can like we get special hardware in. Yeah, I mean, the other thing that I think we want to make sure we do as we're doing this is um, as we're discovering various issues to push back at, you know, the various, you know, whether various points that, that need to take action, whether it's Mellanox or DPDK or VPP or wherever, to make sure that these Mellanox NICs are supported as well, because they are pretty common and pretty popular NICs. I know that VPP does really well with the ConnectX 5. But I, I, I have very sketchy reports. Uh, actually, I have no reports other than this stuff here in packet about working with ConnectX4 or ConnectX3 because the, the, the people really, really, really interested are mostly interested in ConnectX5. Yeah. Um, one thing that would be good to know as well, and I don't know if we have time to get into this right now because we have about nine minutes left, but, but to be understand why they prefer five over three and four. And uh, so that way when we go, it'll help not only with our understanding in terms of network service mesh and, and implementation, but also it's data we can take to groups like packet.net and say, why is ConnectX5 so important? Yeah, so I think this is something that we should definitely, like, it would be fantastic to have this working before um, before we go over to to ONS, and you know, so that way we can we can discuss and and maybe even 
demo to people who who ask about it on the fly. Uh, but yeah, and I'll see about uh, I'll see if I can get de some details uh, from from Ian about uh, whether or not the the low cost option with their Intel Nix would be good enough to just demonstrate the SRIO the SRIOV side. Um, if if we can use the um, CNX for probably the C2 medium is the best choice. The main issue that we saw was the network setup, if you're going to have more than one node. So it's looked like in the BIOS of the uh, C2 medium and M2X large, those were the ones with the CNX4, it was already enabled. Uh, the network connection, though, if you have um, if you spin up two different nodes and you're wanting them to talk, doesn't is not set up um, in a way that's going to be highly performant. They use layer three by default, and the way that they're connected. connected. So I, I, I chatted a little bit with some of the folks at Packet, and apparently there is some knob somewhere that you can twist uh, in order to get your servers, because every server has two NICs coming in. By default, they port bind them and they do all their networking at L3. There are things that you can do uh, to unport bind them. There are knobs for that. And then have one of them be your normal L3 interface and the other one be an interface into an L2 domain of some kind. Uh, I don't know where those knobs are, but I have been promised that the knobs exist. That sounds they like a, a lot of Nick specific mumbo jumbo. I think it would be nice to be able to do it with, um, you know, Intel, I hate to, you know, say Intel next or jump straight to MLX5, which I guess is, isn't that a little easier to, yeah, I don't know. But, but, but please note, like the, the problem with them that we're having with the MLX next, I am absolutely not convinced yet that it isn't a problem of familiarity uh, at this stage, right? Which is, you know, th with, with all of these SRIOV things, there are the magical incantations you do to make them work. Yes. That's and, the problem. Yeah, and, and it just so happens that lots and lots and lots of people are very familiar with those incantations for the Intel Nix. And I have a lot of trouble finding people who are familiar with them for the Mellanox Nix. Um, and so, or at least the MLX3 and MLX4. I, I do have people who are familiar with MLX5. Um, and so I, 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 I want to make sure we're really clear that it could just be we haven't figured out what all the magic incantations are and, and maybe you have to sacrifice a sheep instead of a goat when you want to get Mellanox Nix to work. I don't know. So with um, with your contacts at Mellanox, do you think, because they have to have some form of CI testing around this or the hardware equivalent of it, uh, do you think that they could potentially give us a little bit of someone's time in order to work out if we have our magic incantation correct? Um, I can reach out again. Um, I, I've reached out to them previously through a couple of different channels. Um, I can reach out again through a couple of different channels and say, look, you know, we, we now have two communities here that are going to be crucial to you, Network Service Mesh and the VNFC in the comparison. We are both stuck. Um, and it behooves us to get unstuck. If you... If we want to uh, hurry them up, we should do it on Intel and say, look, it works with Intel. It doesn't work with yours yet. That, 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 that would be fun uh, you know, and, and relatively easy to do, uh, except for the fact that getting Intel Nix is a little challenging inside the packet. Ah. Uh, OK, well. Because my, my contacts in Intel are much stronger than my contacts in Mellanox. Yeah, that make uh, that makes sense. Jacob at Packet's been very helpful and responsive to the all the issues that we've um, been working on for the CNS comparison project, as well as cross cloud CI. Um, Ed also is very involved on the the cross cloud CI stuff, so I'll reach out to them and and ask maybe about the CNX5. I know they're doing updates there. And if there's other questions, I'm happy to talk with them about it. I do apologize. I have a hard stop and I have to drop. Um, but always a can pleasure. You stick, 
Can you stick around 30 seconds for one more announcement? Sure. We have Docker images on the hub. And uh, thanks to Kyle for working Woo! so hard on this. Hey. So if you need, if you've been waiting for some reason to deploy daemon sets or do other types of integration, the uh, the uh, the group, correct me if I'm wrong, Kyle, the group is Network Service Mesh on, on Docker Hub, uh, all one word. And you should correct. be able to pull images from there. Correct. And, and we will be publishing those um, every time that we merge code in the master for now because of the pace of development. So, and uh, in time, we'll, we'll work out, uh, once we stabilize, we'll work out how to get stable versions onto, uh, 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 onto the Docker Hub so that way you can stick a specific version and not delete the latest bleeding edge. But for now, it's, it's going to be master, uh, master to, to the head of the Docker Hub images for, for, for this moment. So just, just be aware of that. But not expecting to cause major issues at this point, but it, it is a moving target. Uh, with that, I is there is there anything else that anyone wants to discuss before we uh, complete the call? Okay, and uh, again, thanks thanks Taylor. Uh, reaching out and asking them on on your side would be fantastic. And just so you know, we have spoken with both Ed and Jacob a little bit, but uh, I think it would be good to uh, it would be good to ask again to see if there's because it's been a little while since we've asked. Uh, and so with that, thank you everyone for, uh, for attending and, uh, as always, we're available on IRC and network service mesh channel. You can also send us an uh, email on to the network service mesh, uh, groups and, uh, we'll see, we'll see you all next week. Right, goodbye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.